Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. Mishmash Monday, actually Mega Mosh Monday. Hope you had a great weekend this weekend. I had such a busy last few days that today's episode, you know, sometimes when you put out a lot of videos like I do, sometimes you get a little bit of a so-called writer's block. You say, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I don't know. Today, I have just so many things to talk about that, you know, it's going to be over the next week or two of all the things we got to get to. So, um, it might seem a little choppy, choppy, but we got to get it out of there. I got to get out of my head. They're floating around all these ideas. Uh, first off, um, I want to talk about something, uh, from the last episode we did was the padlocks, which a lot of you enjoyed, but there was something in the padlocks from Lisa and Jimmy Campanella that, uh, they sent that a lot of you commented on. I just want to talk about it real quick, starting off. Let's get right to now, that. Now, last week when Jimmy and Lisa sent over the beautiful padlocks, they also sent over a bunch of great keys. And, uh, I have a nice collection of keys and, and it's, it's funny because one of our subscribers by the name of Daryl Digger, a uh, good friend of the show, he's been collecting keys for 54 years, has over 7,000 keys. And so there's a, a lot of people that do collect keys and they're all different types. Some of my favorites are the old jail cell keys. But a lot of you noticed one item in here that really wasn't a key and you brought it up in the comments. And that's this item here. Let me clean it up and we'll discuss Okay, it. there we go. All cleaned up. Let's take a look at here. Isn't that a beautiful button hook this is a most of a, most of the time we use in the victorian age and what this was used for sometimes called a lacing hook a button hook things like that this was meant for using for <clears throat> years ago they didn't have zippers on a lot of items you know everything was button shoes uh trousers uh vests girdles every a lot of things had buttons and, and the way to button uh especially those shoes were very hard to do. You would pass this through the eyelet. Uh, there was a, a eyelet side and a button side. You would pass this through the eyelet, grab the button and pull it through the eyelet. And that's how you would button your shoes. You would use a, a button hook. Today, they still sell them today, believe it or not, for people that have arthritis, things like that. And they have different styles. This would be more for uh, shoes or things like that or stiffer materials. They also have ones that have a loop that are meant for she sh dress shirts, things like that. And again, like I said, they do still sell them. Uh, they were some beautiful shoes back then in the Victorian, and they are making a comeback. They do have shoes, especially in some of the dressy or men's shops. They do have button shoes again. Uh, and you still use a, an old-fashioned button hook. They still uh, look the same, and they still perform the same tasks. So very interesting piece of uh, memorabilia that a lot of you knew exactly what it was. Next up on Thursday, we had the Long Island Tool Meet. What a great time. What a fantastic group of guys. Happiest bunch of people you'll ever meet. We had about 33 people show up. It was a great turnout, great weather. I shot some video. Let's check it out. Now, usually Brian and I get there a, pr a little bit earlier. We go for a walk around the grounds, and it was a beautiful day. So we really enjoyed the weather. And I, like I said, we missed the traffic by getting out there early, and then we wait for the guys to show up. Okay, uh, the first item I want to talk to you about. See this beautiful buffer? This buffer was in the Rolls-Royce dealership in the shop and uh, Joe picked it up for 40 bucks. This Bemis and Cole wrench with a solid metal handle was so close to coming home with me for $20, but I didn't buy it because I stopped buying tools. The next fantastic deal was this cast iron antique miter cutter, which uses blades to make the final cut. That was $40, great deal. Our buddy Mike had such good prices and he was literally giving a lot of tools away. He didn't want to bring them home and just said they're taking up too much room. By the end of the day, he had a whole table full of free tools. So that was really nice of Mike to do.
Mike always brings down some stuff, uh, interesting stuff. Here is a nice pair of brass knuckles with a hidden surprise there on top. Always nice to see these, highly illegal in New York. But uh, this here, this fishing pole, is one of the oldest I've ever seen. You could see the varnish on there was crackling. That was really cool. Unfortunately, I lost the footage of Alex brought down some dividers and other measuring devices for show and tell. But this is the work that Alex does when he does the file work on the knives. Just beautiful work. I hope he brings them down next meeting. As always, Mike and Roger in the background had fantastic stuff. We'll be getting to that. This vice was the next great buy. That's a reed, and that's sold for $80. Beautiful vice. There are so many great things to see that this show had just lots of quality stuff and also inexpensive stuff. Like here, they had some boxes of tools. Right there's a $5 box full of Tremos. Joe picked up a beautiful Tremo wrench. He's going to restore that. How can you beat that? Okay, so you, as you can see, it was just a fantastic time. We had a great time. Now, uh, I have a lot of projects that we're going to be hitting in the next couple of days. Uh, what happens is a lot of people that follow the show, they bring down things that you might be interested in and whatnot. One of those people was a good friend that I met for the first time by the name of Walter. Walter lives out by Riverhead. If you know Long Island, it's, uh, it's about another hour out from, the, uh, from where we meet at the tool meet. And... Walter says, look, I got a bunch of stuff I'm going to bring down. He brought a whole bunch of stuff that obviously I couldn't take. He had his whole car loaded with stuff. But true to form, what a fantastic guy. What an interesting guy. And uh, I said, I got a couple items that I took. And he just thought you might be interested. I know I was interested. And uh, let me show you the stuff that Walter brought down for us to have fun with. Walter remembers I have a uh, passion for cigar, different cigar boxes, and he brought a couple down. Look at this thing. This is the way cigars used to come. It was called a cask, and it was like a small barrel, and uh, that's the way they used to come years ago, and it keeps them real nice. Another interesting cigar box he brought down was this uh, Romeo and Julieta, and you know it's a good one when it comes inside of a box, a box inside of a box. That, uh, that insignia on the top of the box is actually cast metal, uh, very interesting. You can see it's engraved. And um, the it's a red lacquer. Beautiful shit. Brass hardware all along. And look at the inside of this box here. Even the box hinges and the uh, imprinting on the top. Just beautiful. Look at that. Those hinges that go into the box to stop it. I mean, uh, and then it has obviously spaces for all the cigars. So very interesting. You never see ones like this around here. But I wonder what that must cost. Next up, Walter brought down this awesome pickup truck. It's got to be from the the 40s, I'm thinking, because of the tires, the, the, the type of truck it was. Um, just a, a lovely rendition, right? And you know some kid had a blast with this thing and probably left it in his yard. Looked like maybe it was a, a service truck, possibly a fire truck. I don't know. It needs a little repair, a little cleanup, a little paint. I think we could do a nice job on this. So that'll be a fun project. Okay, so this is the item for me that put it over the top. This is the one I knew that I wanted. Incredible piece of history. Do you know what this is? Obviously, it's a spotlight of some sort. It's huge. Uh, it's got to be 18 inches across. Heavy. It's, uh, it's an outdoor light. You could see here it says Sylvania. Can you see that? Sylvania. And uh, this usually had two bolts so you can aim it. All nice hardware. Do you know what this is yet? Do you know where this came from? This is a spotlight off of the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building, an iconic landmark in New York City, built in 1933. Uh, King Kong climbed it, and it was one of the eight wonders of the world. 
uh, fantastic building. It, originally, it was illuminated by a couple searchlights. Then they went to a couple of the lights like I have, spotlights. Now, since 2012, they use LED lights that are capable of 16 million colors. And uh, it's a tourist attraction every day of the year. Now, I believe Walter said that this was a thousand watts, which isn't a, you know, a lot, but if you have a whole bunch of them up there, that's a lot of wattage. That's why they replaced them. Uh, but what I'd like to do is take it apart, see if we can first see if that bulb is, is a working bulb. The cord, this was a, a cord that I doubt was original to, it was probably hardwired in, but somebody probably tried to put a cord on it. Let's take a look at this. It's almost like, remember when I tell you whenever you're gonna find a motor, there's usually some kind of wonky cord. Well, check this out. <laughs> this one's good, huh? <laughs> when you see the wire coming through the tip of the cord, so obviously this is an after, but it was probably hardwired in. But let's see if the bulb works. Let's see if we can't fire this thing up. Hopefully we can. Let's open it up. Now, whoever put these on here, this is uh, this is actually called a standoff. Okay, and a standoff, uh, usually used in electronics, things like that, if you want to build a secondary board on top of the first one. Uh, it's threaded. They have double-ended standoffs where they have two threaded sides. They have double female where it's two on each side look like that. This one here is a standard which has a male and a female and it raises something up. This is not the knobs that went on there. So we took these off. Let's open it up. Okay, move these away. And this is on a hinge back here. You have to be careful. Again, this is a, a glass lens and it probably cost more than... Okay, here we go. Now, there's your reflector. You got to be very careful with these reflectors. I tried polishing one up once and I almost uh, <laughs> I kind of ruined it because some of these reflectors are very uh, susceptible to scratches, but that's still good. So here's the bulb. You can see it's a st it looks like the halogen type bulb and they usually just pop in. It's made for easy replacement. Again, what usually would happen is these spotlights had almost knobs. They were uh, like a, a knob, like a uh, an aluminum, cast aluminum knob. So you would flip this up, you would put the knob on this way, the bulb could be changed in a matter of minutes. You would uh, take the knobs, put this out, pop it out. So let's, let's test that bulb and see if it's still working. Okay, so here we go. You can see the bulb here. It says Sylvania 1000 and the number there. And on the other side, and which is very interesting if you notice, here we go, it says USA, but it says 130 volts. Now remember what I was telling you, when they want something to be long life, they rate it for a higher voltage than the 115 to 120 that we normally have. So uh, the bulb don't look burnt. There's the, uh, the film, look at that monster filament. And uh, you can see this little hole uh, pins in there that go into the bottom of the bulb. See, there's a pin and there's a pin slot, so it's very easy to switch out. Let's clean this up and give it a test to see if it works. The quickest way to test the filament bulb is to put this on ohms continuity, where it beeps. Touch both ends here, one and the other. We have beeps, so this bulb should work. Now we're just going to clean this up, put it aside. When we put this in, we'll wipe it down with alcohol because this gets so hot that any finger oils could stain or, you know, see. you see what it did there, so... We'll just clean it and uh, put it aside. When we put it in, we'll wipe it down with alcohol. Okay, to try and clean, you could see here for the years of weather or whatnot, it left kind of a film, especially on the outside. To try and clean this as best we can, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove it. There's three screws here and two screws here. We'll take the three outer ones out first. See these here? There's three of those, one, two, and three. And then we'll pop this out and see if it's connected. This might be connected to the wiring. So uh, let's see what we can do. Okay, we disconnected the wiring, the little socket attachment. There's a reflector, very lightweight. I hope it's not glass because I'll wind up breaking it. I swear I got the dropsies today. We have a, uh, look at this. You can tell it's old porcelain, porcelain wire nuts. Can you see that? Along with two, looks like earwigs. <laughs> They're a creepy bug, aren't they, the earwig? Anyway, uh, that's it. And here is, this is a ceramic or something that bolts to the bottom. Now what we're going to do is we're going to clean the reflector, vacuum these guys out. It looks like the wiring's good. The wiring nuts are in there. And uh, 
We'll put a new plug on, put it back together. Now, from many years of being uh, in use and stuff, I washed it with, with water. And uh, you could see that this here is like a, a fog or moisture that got in there. It's kind of almost like baked on. So in order to get that off, you have to be very careful with this because this will show scratches or whatever. But I did a section here. Could you see that section over there? You could see it. There you go. You see that? This little section? I use my Bush's aluminum pile, uh, polish because it's, it's meant for very fine, soft metals. And I'm going to try and get rid of this haze around the outside. See that haze? I'm going to try and get rid of that and then put it back in. Okay, there we go. It looks real nice. Real clean. Got rid of that haze. Ready to reinstall. For the outer lens, we're going to start off with some Bonami glass cleaner along with some triple O steel wool, followed by some glass wax. Okay, we cleaned the reflector, cleaned the bulb, alcohol the bulb, put everything back. We siliconed the gasket. There's a rubber gasket that goes over there, so that'll seal nice. Everything's back. Now we just got to put a cord on, a plug. And we'll fire okay, it Okay, uh, well, you know I hate two-part videos, but we're going to have to make this one a two-part video. I did put the uh, plug on. This one here is rated for 1,500 watts, so this one here will handle the current. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try it and see if we get some power to the bulb, make sure it's not burnt out. And then next episode, we'll have the, you know, I'll show you what it looks like at night outside. So let's put it into the Variac and bring up the power slow. Okay, the Variac is on. Let's slowly bring current into here. And you should look at the filament of that bulb. There we go. You see that orange glow? That's at uh, 15 volts. Let's bring it up a little bit here. Okay, we got about 30, 35, 40. Okay, this does work. So we're gonna have a good time on Wednesday when we uh, try this out outside. Okay, so in closing, uh, really interesting light. Special thanks to Walter for a lot of stuff. And again, we're gonna be covering a bunch of other uh, things that were brought down to the, uh, the meeting. But uh, one thing I have to say about that light is I don't know if it's uh, focused in because it's not a fluted lens and it, it looks like it might be uh, almost like a spotlight more than a floodlight. We'll have to see on Wednesday. Hope you can tune in. Hope you have a great rest of your week, start of your week, and we'll see you then. Take care now. Bye-bye.